Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, so, this has a forward button, but no backward button. That's quite probably a good thing. Um, so, I'm part educator, part uh, industry person, I guess, and I'm going to touch on what I call the X-shaped curriculum, and there's a lot of synergies with the previous speakers, I think, so some of what I was going to say I don't think need to be said because it's already been covered. Um, let's go forward. So here we are. There's not that many Gen Ys or Gen Zs here, but I always put this up to my, to my students because when you show that slide, they stop doing it, funny enough. <laughs> um, tiny bit about me because it uh, always informs what you do. Um, on the left is me as a kind of academic, I guess, and on the right is me in, in business. And those two have always run in parallel. I originally started working with universities because we needed them to help us on wicked problems that we couldn't solve in industry. And uh, a lot of work in the millennium, or prior to the millennium in the UK, where we worked with the universities on particular design problems, which was really fantastic. And gradually, the universities said, well, can you come to a little bit of uh, workshopping, teaching? By about 10 years ago, I was 50-50, and I'm now uh, about 60% university academic and 40% industry. I've been floating around. Um, the most interesting thing for me now, as my career progressed, I've got more and more in charge of what I do, so I tend to have all the fun stuff. Um, my first job at Cray Research, which at the time was making the world's fastest computers, back in 1989, just to give you an idea of, uh, just kind of reflect on our uh, previous speaker about how you can't tell what's going to happen. That was a computer that I used to code for. Sorry? <laughs> this was a computer I used to code for, which was um, called the XMP. Uh, it cost $10 million in 1989, and it was slightly slower than the first generation iPad. So it really, think about what we're going to have in 20 years' time, it's quite hard to fathom. Um, originally, I wasn't involved in digital things at all, um, apart from a bit of software. I was mostly an engineer building large-scale stuff. Has anyone been on the London Eye? Yeah, you like it? Um, so <laughs> I, was the, I was the lead designer for the capsules and boarding system. We were told it was impossible to make a continuously moving Ferris wheel because people would fall into the river. Um, we demonstrated that that was possible and you can get on and off quite safely with a wheelchair. It was a project that was never going to go ahead. We were told in London by the Royal Fine Arts Commission, which thank God has been abolished, a lot of old white men, that uh, it was an abomination because it could be seen from every park in London. We said that was the point. <laughs> it had a budget of uh, six million dollars, I'm doing the conversion in my head now, and it ended up costing 36 million dollars. Bob Ayling, the uh, chief executive of British Airways, funded it, and it got built. He lost his job a year later. So a lot of miracles to make that thing work. It's now the world's most successful tourist attraction. Also in the millennium, as a, as a young technologist and designer, I had a consultancy which was becoming increasingly multidisciplinary, and I was very, very lucky to work on content for the Millennium Dome, which is now the O2 Arena, with the late great architect Zaha Hadid, and we collaborated together for 10 glorious years. This was the mind zone with Zaha. Um, at the same time as doing building type stuff, I was still keeping a toe in the water with products, and I found this the other day. This is, on the left, a uh, Bluetooth headset I designed for MK as OEM, 2001, and here's Plantronics 2016. Very similar. I actually like to think the MK one is a little bit prettier. Uh, function in functional terms, Plantronics wipes the floor. I, our battery life was about 45 minutes. The weight of the thing, about 35 grams. It's uh, almost unusable compared with what we have today. But it's, it's an interesting thing that the, the, the long tail of technology is always there. We tend to think, wow, it's just coming. We, we're going to get left behind. But VR's been around a long time. Bluetooth's been around a long time. It's now just about working, which is great. And I, I guess the same for VR. Um, projects 
My favorite projects are the ones that never actually went ahead. And this is a Tokyo Guggenheim. We won this project with Zaha Hadid, and it included 600 square meters of video wall, internal and external, to allow the Guggenheim to show their curated uh, new media art. The rest of the building was built out of solar panels and ceramic tiles. Sadly, we won the competition just before 9-11, and uh, you may know the Guggenheim is pretty much funded by ticket sales, so this project never went ahead. A project that went ahead, but was entirely digital, with Langlands Bell, the house of Osama bin Laden. Langlands Bell, British artists, were appointed as war artists to Afghanistan. They went out there and took tens of thousands of photographs, which we painstakingly recreated in uh, the Quake game engine from ID. And that was shortlisted for the Tate Turner Prize, which is one of the most exciting times, I think, for me as an as a art collaborator. Uh, the house was photographed about two days after Bin Laden left, so we even had photographs of his slippers by the bed. Um, something very exciting for me, I discovered this a couple of weeks ago. I bought a set. I've always been a crazy Lego nut. Um, the London Eye is now available in Lego for about $30, so it's not all that accurate. It doesn't have as many capsules, but... Um, <laughs> I love that kind of circular thing. I began playing with Lego, and I'm kind of now seeing some of my designs end up in Lego. OK, so that's me. What has this done? On my academic side, I've now built a significant curriculum in six different institutions. And I, I would like to say that it gets easier each time and that I get the curriculum more and more perfect. It doesn't. It gets harder each time, because every time I do it, I learn the limitations of what's possible and what's probable and what's practical. Um, but I think the results probably do get better. They're certainly more collaborative than ever. Um, first thing uh, I always say to everybody is do what took you 25 years in five. Like, it took me 25 years to figure out all the things that I figured out. My students want that a lot quicker. And it's not going to fit into a curriculum. It's going to fit into a curriculum plus several years, either co-op and when they graduated. Generation Z kids don't wait. They're impatient. And a lot of the uh, people who are going to lose their jobs are the ones who are going into the de-skilled zone that we've, that we've talked so much about earlier. We came up with the notion of the X-shaped designer. And it was a riff, in a way, on the T-shaped designer, which you've seen the de-school were big on, IDO, somebody with a core discipline that could reach out to others. We said, no, actually, it's the X. Uh, because we want people to be familiar and capable in four points, art, design, enterprise, and science. Doesn't mean they have to have mastered them all, but it's going back to more of a kind of Renaissance model, I guess. Sort of projects where this has worked absolutely brilliantly, and almost everything I'm showing now, in fact, everything, they're projects that have either been done by myself with tons of students contributing and faculty, or we've actually done them within the university back into industry. And I think this is one of the things I want to emphasize this morning, is the value that we can contribute as academics, learners, on real projects back into industry is really, really significant. And uh, we've, we've, uh, with all of these programs, we've made significant inroads doing that and been well-funded as well. Um, my one demand, this is a project with Blast Theory, which is a British art practice, and it was a live film that was streamed to several cinemas in Toronto for the Luminato Festival. Very successful, and you can actually watch, watch it online, obviously not live. Um, what was very interesting is uh, a year later, Woody Harrelson did a similar thing, and um, I stumbled upon his set, that's me, just before I was thrown out. It was uh, next to my condo in London. Um, this one, if we can just tap it. This is a project that we launched at Facebook in Toronto a uh, couple of weeks ago. And it's a digital media art project which begins with you interacting with an app that will tell you when you're going to expire, uh, video you, and create a living video portrait that changes every day as you age based on there's a day's piece, there's a month's piece. If you want to try that, I just hacked the code so that it will actually work. It's been geofenced, but if you try, if you go to uh, lifespan 
test.com. Any point during the next uh, two days, then you'll be able to find out when your expiry date is. Um, so there's the evolution. We, we claim the X shape as a natural evolution. Now, the interesting thing about this is specialization versus generalization. Talked a little bit about this morning. Um, if everyone on this planet wanted to be an X shaped designer, it would be utter chaos. I think it'd be pretty tricky if they wanted to be T shaped. Historically, the single discipline worked very well. We're pack animals, we all specialize, and it's good for the pack. But I'd say if you want to be in the top, 10%, 5% of what's going on in education to, curric to curriculum that really does bring leaders out, thought leadership, then you need to be producing those X-shaped creatives and sprinkling them liberally around the country and around the globe. It's important when you launch a new program to be able to say who you are going to create because you don't have stuff to show. And it's what is really going to connect with the people who are thinking of coming onto the program. What do, what do I want to be? Not what does the university want to do with fantastic uh, and generous funding. It's what happens to them. Have an amazing building. I think you've got the building, which you're going to make amazing. At OCAD University, we're very lucky that we'll also produce this spectacular but affordable box and uh, the citizens of Toronto have just about got used to it. They're quite a conservative lot. <laughs> um, have an evocative name, and I think you're well on the way there. Uh, this, we did some research into graduate programs. These are some of the top ones around the world. The names, when people try and find realistic, meaningful names, it's all mud anyhow. So you might as well be evocative. There's no academic label yet for what uh, is being thought about here. Um, be relaxed about change, and I think this comes about, I'm really on message with you, Norman. My dean isn't here, so I can say these things. Um, constant change, like rewriting the content. We, we put a lot of effort into creating course descriptions, quality assurance approvals, which means that underneath the hood, we could change content. And that got us into the D School in uh, the Royal College of Art within three years because of that enormous amount of change, huge amount of pressure and stress on staff to achieve that faculty, but we did it. Um, I think the other thing is, we're in a real hybridized universe, and this, this is a student project which I love. The idea of Internet of Things being made out of digital things that are already there and stuffing them into things like kids' toys. So that sort of lateral thinking is great. Uh, we put our students to work on all sorts of things. This is, this is a interactive museum uh, ex exhibition walkthrough with uh, a, a game as a reward for kids to persuade them to actually read the stuff because most kids don't read when they go through museums. Actually, nobody reads when they go through museums anymore, apart from academics, I think. Um, and that was uh, for the Pan Am Games in Toronto last year, a very successful piece of work. More interesting because students did it, uh, probably more affordable for the, for the client as well. We put a lot of effort into developing tools as well. And we have something uh, I developed a number of years ago called the Pack of Good Advice, which we give out to most of our students. We do a lot of workshopping. We have something called the Marketplace Casino, which allows them to test ideas before they actually have to invest any time and effort in them. These are all important for kind of brand awareness and to build a sense of the culture and continuity as you go from one intake of students to the next. Live projects, experimental ones. This is a cafe project, very simple. We project tweets onto people's coffee. <laughs> Cheap equipment in the ceiling, and uh, if you flick your finger, then the tweet can get sent to someone else in the coffee shop. And it was an idea of a lot of people sitting in coffee shops thinking, this is great, this is very sociable, but they don't actually talk to anybody else in the coffee shop. So <laughs> that kind of makes it happen. And I guess this slide, again, um, I think uh, Megan said, let, let us know what you think emerging media arts is. I, I, I haven't actually said. Just going to show you more pictures. To me, it's almost everything. And these are projects we've done all over the place. Uh, top right, pop-up cinema in Christchurch after the earthquake in New Zealand. The bottom middle, we've got um, something called Level Up, which is a massively successful games exhibition that we do for one night only every year in Toronto. Bottom right, one of my colleagues, Kate there, with uh, a wearables lab, bottom left, 
a project in Ghana, um, Top Center, a riff on uh, Hitchcock's movie Rear Window, which was where we built a fake rear window in the center of Sydney and had a couple in a kitchen doing crazy things, falling, falling, in, falling out, throwing things at each other, making love, you name it, it was all there. Um, so everything, in a way, is emerging new media. Um, how do you put that into a curriculum? Well, you have to do it all. What is vitally important for a university, never forget skills, projects, and theory. You have to have them all, because that gives you the synergy, it gives you the intellectual value, it gives the students the possibility of being thought leaders and also to develop critical thinking skills. This is the shopping list which has really been covered by everybody else. Um, what would I say within there that is really important? Um, right at the bottom, that should probably have been the top one, uh, discovery-based learning. And in fact, this notion of being comfortable and confident to tear up content, restart it, rewrite, co-design with students is phenomenally powerful. But we've also got to remember it's, it's phenomenally difficult. If you're new faculty or um, you know, on tenure track, to do that in your first couple of years, really, really hard. So I think the other message there, please, please don't forget that everybody's got to br be brought along on this journey. You can't just hire superstars. Everybody has to learn to do this. And there are many people that I've worked with in all the different institutions who have been absolutely fantastic once they're brought on board with a bunch of training, mentoring, et cetera, et cetera, that they didn't, wouldn't normally get if uh, they were just told, OK, go and do this, teach this, so-and-so did it last year. So discovery-based learning, not just for the students, but also for the staff. Thank you.